I am delighted to introduce our guest today, Corey. Uh, Corey is a, a very seasoned Chief Product Officer work, uh, today. Uh, currently, Corey is the Chief Product Officer at Black Hawk Networks, which is a fintech company. He can share more about that. Prior to that, he was the Chief Product Officer for Lively, which is a health tech company. And prior to that, he was the SVP of a product leading um, change change health and uh, took the company from a startup to scale up and all the way to IPO. You can hear a lot of his experience there. And Corey and I actually met um, back in the days at PayPal where Corey was leading the global business of Prada and taking the Prada line to over 5 billion in, in, in payments. So a wealth of experience, a wealth of, of knowledge, super excited to hear more from Corey today on how to build your product organization structure. I'm sure different size, different time, lots of, uh, of insights. So without further ado, I'm going to stop share and Corey, uh, take away and share your, um, share your insights and learnings, please. I will definitely do that. Thank you, Becky. And I, I see some of the folks on, I think I even know some of the folks. So for those that I know, um, great to great to see everybody again, and um, I appreciate the opportunity to to spend some time and chat with you about kind of my learnings over the years of of, of setting up and hopefully you know building and, and growing product teams. And one of the trickiest things is how to get the organization right. So, Becky, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I love when people use the word season. That's code word for old, which which I am definitely now. Um, so look, I put together um, a couple of thoughts. I'll try to keep my comments to about 20 minutes, hopefully even less, and then um, open it up for, for questions. So first, let me just make sure you're you're seeing my screen. And, yes, I can see your screen. Okay, are you seeing the full screen or the, the presenter's view? Hopefully it's-, it's, yeah, it's Presenter view, perfect, full screen. Perfect, okay, great. So um, so let me, let me jump right in. I, I think, um, you know, one of the trickiest things that I, I've come across in my career is, you know, whether you run an entire product organization or simply just a product, if you have more than one person, um, you're constantly challenged with how do you op how do you organize and structure in such a way that you, you basically get what you want out of that product effort. And so um, I've refined an approach over the years that I'll share with you. Uh, hopefully it works for some of you, but it really comes down to, I would say maybe three basic principles. And then I'll provide an example of how I put it into practice. So first is always kind of coming back to your product vision and mission. You always need to figure out kind of what you're trying to accomplish and how that focus on the product side is gonna align with the business, the business strategy. The second thing is I think there's some organizational principles uh, that are really helpful to kind of ground the effort. Um, and so I'm gonna share with you how I kind of view those principles. And then finally, how do you, how do you come up with the right design? And like I said, I'll try to put all this together um, when we get to kind of how do you put this in practice? So, so first, um, starting with kind of a vision and, and the first question you probably would ask is, you know, why is that important? Um, it's important because an org structure will play a critical role in how the development team, and when I say development team, I'm broadly speaking about the entire cross-functional team that comes together to build the product, um, is charged with bringing that product and product experience to life. Um, org structures, if they're anything, they're basically communication vehicles that help teams, um, it helps enable teams to deliver on the product vision. And it's a simple concept in principle, but it's very difficult to get right. Because org structures have to triangulate that communication effort between team members, which are constantly changing in terms of personality, maturity, um, their knowledge. Uh, and then you throw in time zones and locations and the fact that we all are living on Zoom. And then if you add another, uh, another complexity on top of that is basically market and competitive dynamics, which you know, sometimes force a change in your tactics, um, sometimes force you to, to pivot. And, you know, I think lastly, the size of the team, um, generally the greater number of people, the more complex the org design will be. So an org structure has got to keep all those things in mind, which is one of the reasons why companies see companies reorg an awful lot. It's not because they didn't quite get it right the first time. It's that a, there's a lot of things that an org structure is trying to solve for. So what I try to do is to come back to who do you serve, 
What value do you deliver or what problem do you solve? And how does the product portfolio or the product features support the business vision? Always keep those in mind. And then I came across a principle years ago called Conway's Law. And Conway's Law is basically, and this is an image, if you go on to Google and you search for Conway's Law, this is an image that comes up very often. If you can read some of these things, it's, it's, it's actually comical in, in many ways. When you think about the things that an org structure has to has to deal with, you know, who who doesn't like whom, who gets along with whom, um, is there resentment, you know, all these things kind of are, are, are part of uh, the challenges of creating a great org structure. But essentially, the principle was set forth by a gentleman named Melvin Conway, and he basically, in paraphrasing, it says, any organization that designs a system defined broadly, will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. In other words, what you build will be highly correlated to how you're structured. And, and, and sometimes over the course of my career, I, I hear these expressions that if you look at a company's website, it will tell you exactly a reflection of how it's organized, be it good or bad. So I think the goal of Con the goal that Conway sets out for any organizational design should be to deliver the desired product solution by minimizing the friction that's caused by the natural boundaries any structure creates on value delivery to the customers we serve. I'm going to say that one more time because there's a lot in there and I think it's important to think about it. Any organization is going to create natural bound boundaries. And the goal of an org organizational structure is to minimize the friction that's caused by those boundaries that keeps us from uh, delivering value to the clients that we serve. And it, that's a really important thing to keep in mind. So what are our options? What are the principles that we try to lean into? First of all, there's many different ways to design an organization. And I'll give you a couple of options that you can ground on. The first one is you could actually design based on the, a, a products, a set of clearly defined products. Um, there's some pros and cons to each one of these options. Product-driven design, you know, the pros are very clear accountability. It's very easy to tell, you know, who owns which product, who's responsible for that product. The objectives of each product hopefully will be fairly clear. But when you take that approach, there are some negatives to that. And again, it comes back to what are you trying to achieve? What's your vision and mission? And one of the cons that I come up with on the product-driven approach is that you tend to have struggles with cross-team collaboration. Um, it's also hard to create an integrated solutions experience. So if you are a client that wants to, you know, access multiple products, when you organize based in product silos, sometimes that experience for cutting horizontally across that portfolio sometimes can be a challenge. Not, not something that can't be overcome, but it's just something to keep an eye on and watch out. And I threw a couple of examples in there, kind of Apple, you know, is very driven through a product design structure, Adobe, um, the same thing. Both companies, by the way, have figured out a way to streamline the horizontal experience that their customers see and achieve. So it's definitely possible. Um, option two is to organize based on technical domain. Um, and the, the fantastic you know, pros to this is that it's very easy to scale common services or shared services uh, between different, between different um, application uh, teams. Uh, again, clear, clear accountability. Um, when you think about the challenges though, it does put heavy burden on the technical teams or the, I would say the common services teams because they, get, they have a lot of uh, consumers that demand their service and those consumers may not demand exactly the same, uh, same thing. So there's sometimes a challenge in how those teams prioritize their roadmaps and their, and their, um, and their evolution of those platforms. So great examples of this in the banking industry. We're all familiar with, you know, banks. They tend to, you know, organize around checking accounts, savings accounts, and investments. Um, if you're if you're in the software side of things, think about um, running a browser service, but having different teams assigned to different technical platforms that that browser should work across. Um, so in, anyway, you know, again, there's probably you guys probably can think of other examples. I'd love to hear them, but. Um, that's not an uncommon way to structure a product organization. The third option is customer segment. This is um, very prevalent in telecom and, and, and many, um, many businesses that kind of have the same service, but they want to place a context around that service that 
speaks directly to a very specific customer segment. So obviously it's extremely customer and customer segment centric. Um, it simplifies needs discovery. I think when you're trying to understand what the needs are of a particular segment, since you're organized by segment, there tends to be a pretty strong ability to know and, and propagate what that segment needs um, are throughout the organization. Again, I, I come back to the technical uh, domain option. You sometimes have difficulty prioritizing shared services. So if, uh, if you're Verizon and you have a very specific software application or platform for your mobile devices, again, how you evolve those may present some prioritization challenges because consumers uh, need something slight differently than, than, than businesses or small business versus enterprise. Um, option four, customer customer journey and life stage. And actually, my some of my time at PayPal, we did organize part of my product team um, based on uh, kind of uh, life cycle, lifestyle um, life cycle uh, stage. So pros are uh, fantastic cross cross domain applicability. If you build a great onboarding experience, you can apply that to pretty much you know all types of product solutions. I'd like to call it one of the best ways to maintain institutional memory. Since you're not having to rebuild an onboarding or a reporting or a servicing experience for every single product, um, it's a great way to kind of ma maintain um, institutional memory across teams. The cons are co uh, context switching. You know, if you're running a, an onboarding team, uh, just think about all the different contexts you have to consider when you're trying to develop the optimal onboarding flow. And so uh, anyway, some examples, tr uh, trail, it should be trial, sorry, my spelling's terrible. Onboarding, servicing, cross-sell and retention might be one way that you might wanna organize that team. And then um, option five, another option um, would be organized based on performance metric or KPI. And I see this a lot. Um, you can align your teams based on uh, client acquisition, uh, a team focused on client retention, team focused on optimizing revenue per client or even the number of products per client. I see, I do see a lot of uh, organizations organized that way. Fantastic for accountability, fantastic for clear objectives. But again, sometimes it's a little difficult to translate into specific product features. It's hard to say I'm in charge of new client acquisition and then roll that directly into a series of features that actually help you acquire new clients. Um, but again, Come back to your product vision and mission. What are you trying to accomplish? How does the product portfolio serve the business strategy? And all these things are important when you think about kind of options that you that you might want to lean into. So before we put this into practice, I think the last thing that we need to consider, and this is something that is usually ignored um, in any org structures, and that is, um, you know, what what's the uh, what's the talent base? What the, what can the talent base support? What's the culture of the organization? It seems a little bit soft, but it's one of the most important factors to determining whether any or uh, design is going to work for your for your your organization. Um, you know, will the body reject the organ? And and if you don't think about the skill set of your team, what's the experience level of the team members? What's their business maturity? What's their domain industry maturity? What's their skill level and set? Um, what drives motivation within the organization? What's what are how does the organization develop or encourage engagement? Um, you know, I don't think any org structure will work unless you really consider these factors as part of a part of that thought process. So I, I included in here a, a, an old TED talk. It's probably now going on 15 years old, which I still once in a while look at, which is Daniel Pink's um, what, what motivates us. And so I constantly come back to that when I think about setting up OKRs or setting up um, or having major organizational changes and shifts that, that are ahead of me. Come back to what drives us as humans, uh, what motivates us as humans. Um, whether you agree with Daniel's uh, uh, framework or you have other frameworks, if you don't think about what the, the organization will accept, um, then you're probably going to have a failed org structure. So how do you, okay, so now what do you do? You have all these options in front of you. You have an understanding of what the product portfolio is trying to accomplish, but where do you start? And I, a long time ago, I, I worked um, with a gentleman at PayPal um, that brought a framework in from Intuit, which I still use to this day. 
which is uh, what he called planning a page. And it's a, it's a way to think about um, the various components and purpose of an org structure. It basically is a, a playbook for setting up your org design. And it, and it consists of essentially three parts uh, with a, a notion that this same framework would cascade down throughout the organization. It starts with understanding your vision and mission. Um, you know, what's the, what's the statement that articulates, you know, why does the team exist? What is the team there? Who, did, who is the team there to serve and, and what is it there to accomplish? And then when it says, okay, in doing that, in trying to accomplish that vision, what are the essential bodies of work uh, that we need to get done? What are the jobs that need to get done to actually um, produce that vision? And so we, we flipped that and said, that really is the organizing principles for how we do the work. And so if you think about the org structure as a reflection of the jobs to be done, that is one of the best ways to at least kind of set up the foundation of the house. And then within that foundational structure, if you really align on those three or four critical jobs to get done, then you start to say, okay, for that, for that individual part of the structure, what are the big rocks? What are the outcomes and deliverables um, or major enablers that this part of the org should set out to achieve? And if you take that same structure and you propagate it from your leadership team to the next level down, to the next level down, all the way throughout the org, it should be a way to have a structure that's very clearly articulating the jobs to be done and the levels of accountability throughout the org, no matter how big or small the org is, it should hopefully articulate that pretty well. Now, I, I didn't want to just drop a template on you and not give you some idea of how you you go out and fill this out so um and don't worry the template i'll i'll share with you and, and and becky will make sure everybody gets a copy of that i'll share with you um how i use this at a smaller company i was at uh, just recently lively an hsa provider i only had a very small product team with only about 10 folks but i still use the same structure and the same principles to try to build the org structure there so i'm going to read some of this because it's going to be hard for you to absorb it but essentially the charter we had at Lively for the product team was um, was articulated this way, leverage modern design and development techniques to enhance our customers' ability to confidently handle the rising complexity and cost of healthcare throughout their life. Specifically, we provide a broad range of savings and investment options, along with user interactions that build confidence, help them save and accelerate the growth of their assets to stay ahead, stay and keep ahead of the rising cost of care. We also extend those same capabilities to their employers, um, investment and retirement advisors, really with the hope of bringing lively services um, and their products into an integrated ecosystem to manage their, their wealth over time. And then I go on to say to extend the platform and, and scale and things like that. But essentially an HSA account is no different than a 401k account. It's a, it's a wealth development technique to help you save for your healthcare in your later years. And then we put a series of measures that we've created, you know, your ability to create wealth or generate wealth. Basically, it's just a ratio of how much are you saving versus how much you're spending on your healthcare. Um, account acquisition, our ability to acquire new uh, card, uh, new client accounts. And then we had some metrics around customer service and then the speed of moving money and transferring money to pay for care or to save for care. So that kind of helped us kind of articulate, okay, what are the jobs that need to be done for an HSA account holder? Well, first there's an experience, just like a 401k, you need someplace to log into and kind of monitor your, 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 your account, your wealth of your account. And so we had one of the jobs to be done was to make sure that the account owner had the features and tools and capabilities to help them self-manage their, their health savings account. And so that became one of the pillars of our structure. And in fact, at one of our org structures, we had a leader of the account owner experience. We also knew we had to integrate, again, like a 401k, you have a 401k administrator, we have HSA administrator, which basically is your employer that's contributing or matching investment funds into that account. But they need to administer. They need to let you know when somebody's left the workforce or we, we had a new employer join. So then we had another job to be done, which was to make the administration of these accounts for the employer really easy to do. And that became another pillar of organization. And then, and then a lot of what our account did was move money around. 
We gave people the ability to pay for health bills, save for health bills, transfer money in, transfer money out. HSAs are investment accounts, so you can invest in different, you can invest your, your savings in different funds. So there was this whole job to be done around financial management. And then we created a, a part of the organization that was really around money management. And then we had a bunch of other things around data analytics and risk mitigation and things like that. So the structure, the template essentially allowed us to go in and say, here are the critical jobs to be done. And then here are the key deliverables in each one of those areas, which is expressed here in the gray. And we tacked on, how do you measure whether you're effectively getting those outcomes you want? And then we codified that in this artifact. And now what we did is the account owner team, which at the time was only another two product managers, took this same template and they blew it out for the individual outcomes that that team was responsible for. So they had their own template, but it was just focused on some of the outcomes in gray. So that this is a, a system that I've used over and over again, and it, it seems to work. It can get very complex depending how big the, the product organization is. This worked for an organization that was only 10 product people. I manage an organization right now, about 250 product people, and we're doing the same thing. And the cascading function, it, it, it feels heavyweight, but let me tell you, when it's time to do your OKRs, it makes it really easy to kind of articulate what are you trying to accomplish and how do you measure, how do you measure those things? So anyway, um, included, I will make sure that Becky gets you a template. I've included uh, some templates here to help you out, but I would, I would love to open it up and see if anybody has any specific questions that I might be able to answer. Fantastic, Corey. This is amazing. Uh, I already started to see some of the question coming in. Um, and, you know, I just be, before that, I want to just do a quick recap. You know, I realized that amount of the information you cover is more than just org structure. It really is the how to run a product organization, the thoughts around it. So uh, oh, thank you so much for that. Um, would you like to stop sharing so we can? Yeah, that's there. It's great. Um, so a couple questions that I have here from the audience. One is, um, you know, you mentioned org structure and sizing and how, and also you have a sort of the charters and a plan on the page. It seems the change is more frequent than it uh, seems to be. So how often or when do you think that the product organization need to be adjusted, reorganized? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think optimally, I think many of us kind of manage a rolling roadmap um, where every quarter you might be updating that roadmap for the next four to five quarters. Um, but a natural cadence for me, since we tend to compensate our teams on the annual basis, would be every at least every year to go back and revisit the org structure, go back and revisit your objectives, because it's just a natural time that kind of coincides with budgeting and planning and in corporate um, in corporate readouts, company readouts. So uh, at minimum, I would say once a year, you should kind of come back to look at your product vision, product mission, make sure it's still aligned to the to the business strategy, which hopefully hasn't changed that much. And then go back through your org and ask yourself, are these still the outcomes I'm trying to achieve? Where has something changed um, in the market or in our competitive position, or are we making, or we, we think we need to pivot? Uh, and that would always be a natural time to go back and look at your org structure and make sure it's still, it's still trying to get out what you want to get out of it. Right, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, you shared a, a couple of the models and the thoughts around it. And it looks like it, nothing's perfect. And there are always is some sort of collaboration and connection happens. So how should, uh, you know, how do you connect, you know, some of the directions that are not naturally connected is through the, uh, the, the org structure itself? Um, I, and one of, the, one of the reasons why I love that Conway's law picture is because it, it clearly articulates how difficult this is to do. And there are many org structures that I wanted to put in place, but I simply didn't have the right personalities or talent to do that. So you make compromises and you do the best you can. Um, if, if data is a critical part of your strategy, but you don't really have good data analysts or somebody that can like, kind of lead that effort, then you got to find accommodations and, and, take a, and take a different route. So like, like you said, Becky, it's never perfect, but it is something that you constantly should try to evolve and improve upon. 
And so I would say, don't get discouraged. If the structure is not quite what you're, you're looking for, uh, trust me, you know, things change quickly and you, and an opportunity may present itself later on. I think the other thing, the other thing that I will say is I have never, um, been dissuaded by having a piece of the org structure not report to me. And this is an important distinction. And again, personalities of organizations. I'll give you a great example. Um, solution consultants or, sol or sales engineering, um, I believe should be really strongly and deeply affixed to the product organization. But some organizations don't believe that. Some organizations believe it needs to be in the sales group. I am, I am not going to be, uh, I'm not going to let um, the perfect be the enemy of the good or vice versa. So I will work cross-functionally to try to adopt and align with those teams, even if they're not part of the organizational structure and create a shadow or dotted line structure to still get what I need accomplished, even if they don't report into the product team. So I think the, the, what I'll leave you with is just be flexible um, and don't think that everything should always be exactly as, as you want it to be. Sometimes you make compromises and that's fine. Because again, at the, at, the, at the heart of an org structure, it's a way of people communicating with each other. And that needs to change as people change and the, and the, and the elements change. Right, that sounds cool. Uh, I just realized what that question was. So someone asked that how have you used the POP to share goals and deliverables with the GTM team? And I realized POP is a product operations. So uh, have you or how do you use the product ops to tie in, share the goals and, and deliverables given there are in, in, you know, inherent you know, silo or whatnot due to any type of org structure? Let me think pro in product operations as, a, as an, an organizational the team, role. the role. Yeah. That's it's fascinating because I literally just hired my first head of product operations about, awesome. about a month ago, and I'm just trying to bring her into the into the fold here. It, it's a great question. I don't think I'll have a great answer for you. Um, I established her goals as really helping the product managers be as uh, effective as they can be um, through either better data that's at their fingertips, um, training and skill development and better just transparency over what they're trying to do. So I'm still in the process of working in product operations into that framework. But if we added another goal to my framework and their job to be done is to make sure you have a very highly effective um, product team that's very market aware, but tied into the go to market activities, I would probably have a series of outcomes that I'd want product ops to roll into and, and a bit, an ability to measure that. And they would just fall right into the tree of our plan in the page objectives. That's cool. Um, so I think we are kind of running low on time. So there are a couple more questions that I'll follow up with you. We can get questions uh, you know, through emails and send out to everyone else. Uh, we do have a standard question for every guest on the call, on, on the session. So I wanna send it to you as well, which is, you know, in your experience as you know, chief product officer, you definitely have been to and, and worked with many what do you think are a couple of the top factors and things to differentiate a good product, a chief product officer from a, a great chief product officer? Mm. Well, I don't know if I'm a great or good. I think my <laughs> boss will have to tell you whether what she thinks. Um, I, I, I always come back to the same thing, which is, you know, be extremely customer focused not necessarily customer responsive, meaning I'm not gonna just do what you think you, you want me to do, but I'm gonna get behind what it is you're trying to accomplish and solve for. And I'm gonna to come to you with a innovative and differentiated approach to solving that problem. And that, that means you have to know your customers inside and out. And I think those product managers that have a, a pulse on um, both the emotional, contextual and functional things their customers are trying to solve for, I think they'll usually be ahead of the game. Um, and so my mantra is if there's a debate internally or uh, uncertainty or ambiguity, come back to what do you think that customer really wants? And hopefully you know the customer well enough that pretty much anything you come out with would be accretive to that customer's life. So that's what I'd start with. Um, and then I'd probably fan out from there in terms of market awareness and things like that. But I try to uh, be with my customers as much as possible. That's amazing. So thank you so much for a, a wonderful session. Very, very informative. So very rarely you can hear from a seasoned CPOs on how to structure organization. Now we know through working with a, 
thousands of CPOs across the globe, we know not only they have a system, they have the people, they also need the right tool. So Dragon Boat is the tool built for outcome focused organizations and to product officers. So if you're interested in know more, um, log on to dragonmo.io slash CPO, and the session is recorded. Additional questions will be answered through emails. So thank you um, for joining us today. And thank you so much, Corey, for sharing with us your, your experience and wisdom. Thank you for inviting me, Becky. Nice to see everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>